Hello, my name is Thomas Wisniewski. As a graduate student in the Department of Comparative Literature, I'm here this afternoon to discuss a new work of scholarship in Italian studies. And today I'm joined by Laura Whitman, Assistant Professor of French and Italian at Stanford University, and the author of The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Modern Mourning, and the Reinvention of the Mystical Body. Good afternoon, Laura, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really a great honor to be here. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say uh, that this book is really a remarkable work of scholarship, which covers an impressive array of sources, both primary and secondary. In the book, um, you discuss journalism, historical accounts, fiction, mm -hmm. poetry, memoir, personal correspondence, and cinema, as well as very th recent theoretical work on trauma studies and psychoanalysis. Now, that's quite a lot of material, so I wanted to ask you, how was it that you came to write this book in the first place? And how did you deal in terms of methodology with that amount of material? Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words. I'm very flattered. Um, so I came to this subject actually through literary texts, through reading D'Annunzio's works, and especially his Notturno, which is a work about his experiences in World War I, but some of his other works from, uh, from post the post-war period. And he mentions The Unknown Soldier a few times, and I was just really curious, you know, what is, why is he talking about this, and what is it? And I knew there was a monument in Rome, but I didn't know much more, and so it really brought me to investigate what that was. And I discovered that, in fact, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is a World War I invention. It's a very new type of war memorial. And it was invented pretty much concurrently um, in Italy, France, and England uh, around the years 1919, 20, 21. And what makes it really unique is that it contains a single anonymous body. So in previous wars, when bodies were lost, they would either have a completely empty tomb or they would have ossuaries with a lot of bones in them, but they would never collect a single body. So this made this monument uh, unique. And when I discovered that this monument was so important to D'Annunzio, it also opened up all these materials that you mentioned, in that I discovered the topic was not only a literary topic, but it involved popular culture, it involved uh, monument making, it involved military history, you know, so I had to investigate all of these different things. And um, I think finally I was brought to, I was brought to talk about trauma and recent work on trauma because I really wanted to bring this topic into the present and talk about how uh, memorials for World War I still have something to say about how we think about being at war now and, and the, how we deal with veterans returning from war and dealing with, with war trauma. So uh, that kind of you know, brought in those more theoretical, recent theoretical works for mm -hmm. me. And you work not only with text, but also with a number of images, mm -hmm. um, black and white images, uh, some of which are photographs taken by you. Mm -hmm. Some are gathered from archives, both in the US and in Europe. And one very striking image I found in the book is that of Gabriele D'Annunzio uh, kneeling before the banner of Randaccio in the free state of, of, of Fiume, which is now in Croatia. I think the photograph was taken in 1921. Um, and I would think that a publisher might limit the number of photographs one could include in a book. So I wonder, how did you come across some of these images and what led mm -hmm. you to choosing, reproducing and selecting a number of mm -hmm. them to include in the book? And is there any image in particular that captures um, an idea you wanted to get across to your readership? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you picked a very good image. That's <laughs> a very important one. I think in general, I would say that I, um, I used as many images as, as I could to I think bring it home to the reader that these issues were very present in popular culture and in the media at the time, right after World War One. And there's, you know, I think the images really show that uh, the newspaper, popular newspapers, you know, so the equivalent of the New York Times or Time Magazine, or even something like People Magazine today, they would have images of uh, ceremony, mourning ceremonies, and uh, and often images of D'Annunzio, who was a central character. And I really wanted to bring that home to my readers. Now, more specifically, this image you mentioned is a, is a very important one because, indeed, it happened at Fiume, and, and maybe I should talk about that a little bit. Fiume was this extraordinary episode in Italian history when uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who was, at the time, Italy's sort of foremost poet and writer, but he was also a war veteran who had, uh, had sort of given many charismatic speeches, uh, interventionism, getting Italy into World War I in the first place. Um, and after the war, he uh, and many others were unhappy that Italy did not receive territory, territories in Dalmatia. So we're talking about uh, essentially 
uh, eastern, the, the, the borders with uh, Yugoslavia mm -hmm. and uh, with the Austrian Empire. And uh, so the Italians were very unhappy that they had not received these territories during the Treaty of Versailles. And the Nuncio led a paramilitary band of veterans to take over this city of Fiume that, uh, that he thought should be Italian. And so you have to think about it, a poet leading a paramilitary band to take over a city. And they occupied this city for a little over a year, so from towards the end of 1919 until the end of 1920. And D'Annunzio used it as a platform to make known to the whole world, you know, his and Italy's unhappiness about the situation. And he created these grand gestures and sort of very theatrical uh, happenings there, uh, such as, you know, stealing the Italian military's horses and uh, when told you must return them or we will starve you out and cut off your provisions, he said, well, okay, here they are, but he returned these emaciated, uh, almost dead horses that had been at Fiume for a long time. So he liked to play these kind of practical jokes on the military. Uh, but of course, eventually the Italian government felt rather humiliated that they couldn't control this poet. And they finally bombed Fiume. And um, that was actually the most, the, the time the most people died during this episode. And the picture, to get back to that, the, the photograph that you chose was uh, an occasion where D'Annunzio uh, took this large Italian flag that he that had a lot of symbolic value for him and he unfurled it over the coffins of his own paramilitary fighters but also over the coffins of the Italians who had been fighting against them. I mean this was essentially a civil war and he really wanted to indicate that they were all um, they should all be mourned in the same way even though they had fought against each other so that's why that image is so important. Absolutely. Um, D'Annunzio, he, he certainly seems to be a figure who looms large throughout your book. Mm -hmm. um, you cite from, you analyze his letters, um, his political manifestos, excerpts from his fiction and his poetry. And you also give a lot of attention to um, his Notorno, which he wrote in Venice in 1916, rather remarkably after being immobilized and wounded um, and nearly blinded in an airplane accident. Mm. Um, as you mentioned in the book, Notorno is commonly read as a popular evocation of the immediate aftermath of World War I. And it was not coincidentally, we think, um, scheduled to be published also on the day of the Unknown Soldiers' um, inauguration in Rome, um, November 4th, 1921. Mm -hmm. So that leads you to argue um, that Notorno's been somewhat overlooked in the scholarship in its connection to um, the monument of the unknown soldier. I wonder if you might speak a little to that and to the mm -hmm. occasion of his writing mm -hmm. um, Notorno in the first mm -hmm. place. So the, the writing, as you suggested, is very interesting in that he had this seaplane accident and was blinded in one eye and almost lost his other eye. And in order to preserve, to heal his other eye, he had to be uh, immobilized in complete darkness for, I think, about three months or four months. And during that time, he managed to write on thin strips of paper where there'd be only two or three lines of, uh, of writing at a time. And uh, people have associated this with the fact that the Noturno is, for D'Annunzio, it's a very minimalist, spare style compared to his very long and, and sort of overwhelming novels that he wrote before the war. And I think, of course, the, it's true that the strips of paper forced him to do this. I also think that it, it came from the experience of the war itself, because the book really talks about, uh, it, it talks about all of the dead comrades that, that he uh, fought with and mourned. And so it's really kind of like a litany for the deceased, and it really has this very minimal style that we could associate with other poets like Ungaretti. Um, and so I think people have overlooked D'Annunzio's references to the unknown soldier probably for a couple reasons. One of them is that he himself minimized them and I think really uh, wanted to assert his precedence, sort of say, I talked about mourning and I imagined mourning before this monument was created. So he mentions the monument only at the very end of the Noturno and, and wants to sort of show I came first, you know. Um, and I think the other reason really is something that you mentioned much earlier, which is the interdisciplinary um, nature of the unknown soldier topic. So people have written about D'Annunzio's poetry and prose, or uh, totally different people have tended to write about World War I memorials. But I think it's putting those two things into dialogue that um, has really helped, you know, at least for me, has helped illuminate the topic. 
Um, I very much admired the last chapter of the book, which moves forward from the past to the present and examines not only how we might interpret the legacy of the tomb of the unknown soldier, mm -hmm. but also proposes, I think you might say, an ethics of compassion. And in light of recent events, such as the 2003 public mourning of Italian veterans who were killed in Iraq, and also the controversial reception of photographs that were taken of torture victims at um, Abu Ghraib, the prison in Iraq, um, that circulated the media in 2004. Mm -hmm. now, these are both topics you discuss in the last chapter, and I wonder how you see the First World War in relation to these current events. Is it still an abiding model for empathy and compassion? And what can the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier tell us today about contemporary Italian and American and European society when it comes to dying and the way we mourn our dead? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question. That's, uh, of course, a very, a topic very close to my heart since I end the book with it. And I do think there's a strong connection for us still between World War I and um, a sense of compassion and even justice. I think that in some ways it's the last time uh, the West had a war that was perceived perhaps as a just war or uh, a gallant war even. And a typical of this is Jeremy Rifkin's uh, really major book, The Empathic Civilization, that it's an argument in favor of empathy for ecological and global reasons. He begins his book by discussing a famous episode that happened uh, in 1914 when uh, for Christmas the Germans and the French uh, decided to stop shooting at each other and celebrate Christmas together. And this is a moment of sort of transcending national barriers and I think it's a slightly idealized vision of World War I, uh, but it's true to what people believed war to be as the war began. And of course it's the war that really traumatized Europe, the greatest number of losses than in, in any other war. Uh, the first time warfare became anonymous. So by the end of the war, I think people no longer believed uh, in this sort of vision of compassion or of transcending barriers, but they still believed it was important. And so I think in their uh, rituals of mourning, that was uh, a key thing. The imagination uh, Understanding that people died for a, a cause, but also understanding that they're, we, they have to be mourned beyond uh, nationalistic boundaries. And so it's interesting from this perspective that there is an unknown soldier. There is one in France, there's one in Italy, there's one in England, but then later there was also one in Germany. And almost every nation in the world has had one since then. So there's a sense in which this memorial really says death at war is tragic in a way that transcends nationalism. And I think that's where an argument for compassion or empathy comes in. And I would say that we tend to, we tend to minimize death at war. We tend to forget that we're at war right now. And certainly our media tends to not um, create rituals of mourning or ways to express the trauma of, of death at war. And I think that, that minimizes the truth of warfare in ways that are pretty dangerous. And so that's why I brought in Abu Ghraib uh, sort of as a counterexample. Um, these were photographs of torture victims, right, that, that circulated um, actually all over the internet, even more than in the newspapers. And um, as Susan Sontag claimed, there's something very disturbing about their circulation because instead of bringing home the reality of torture to us, in a lot of cases they tend to objectify it, allow us to distance it, create a kind of voyeuristic image of torture. And it's important to remember all these torture victims had hoods over their heads, so a lot of their personal identity was erased. Um, and I think this is in contrast with a, a lot of what was written about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, where people went out of their way to talk about uh, literally what his face would have looked like, what his personal identity would have been. So I think the monument invites us to have a more personal and more embodied imagination when we think about mourning the dead. Thanks for joining us today and congratulations on the new book. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.